bulletin, we are going to study God's Word this morning, so if you'll open up to Matthew, Matthew chapter 15, we've gone as far as verse 29. Those of you who perhaps are visiting or new to Calvary Chapel, we go through the books of the Bible, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And so we've been in Matthew, we've traveled as far as verse 29 in Matthew chapter 15, first book of the New Testament. And we do read that Jesus departed from there and skirted the Sea of Galilee and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seen, and they glorified the God of Israel." Father, we do come this morning, and we desire to be fed the Word of God. I pray that that our ears would be open, our hearts soft before you, that we would be humbled before you, desiring to hear from you. As the written Word goes forth, that it would feed our souls and our spirits. And Lord, there's something for us here. So I pray that, Lord, that you would bless everyone here. Give us understanding and clarity. And Lord, may we leave here just um, knowing that we've been nourished by you. We've been filled. And Lord, the inner man, the inner woman has been strengthened. So we commit this time to you in the study of your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So Jesus continuing at this point in Matthew's gospel to bring healing to the multitudes that are gathered to him. And they're receiving healing from him as he's healing those of every kind of sickness and disease um, there, uh, as we just read. And in this chapter, what we have seen is you remember that after the feeding of the 5,000, that it was near Passover is what the Gospels tell us. The people would go up to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. And no doubt they're talking about as Jesus is in the height of his popularity, News is spreading all throughout the land and throughout Jerusalem of the miracles that he is working, uh, of the things that he is saying. Matter of fact, after defeating the 5,000, you recall that they wanted to, to take him by force, to crown him as their Messiah. He would dismiss the crowds. So the religious leaders of Jerusalem would come to the Galilee hearing the reports, and they're watching Jesus. They're, they're checking him out, the disciples, And they've already mounted their opposition against him. We've seen that, and that opposition is going to increase as we continue through Matthew's gospel. But we know that they are watching him, and they begin to accuse him, saying that you don't keep the traditions of the elders. And Jesus responded to them by saying that you have made the word of God of no effect by your traditions, and you're blind leaders leading the blind, and you're going to fall into a pit. He would then leave that area of Galilee. He goes about 50 miles to the north and to the west along the coast to Tyre and Sidon, as we saw last time. He ministers to a Canaanite woman who had a great need. Her daughter, her young daughter, was vexed with the demon. She comes pleading to Jesus uh, for healing for her daughter, and Jesus ministered to her in a very miraculous way, but also commended her for her great faith. So now, as Matthew continues here, he picks it up where Jesus begins to go eastward. He's skirting the Sea of Galilee. He's up in that area that today is called the Golan Heights. He's moving into that area that Mark's gospel tells us, that is the Decapolis. Now, the Decapolis was an interesting place, an interesting area, because uh, it was under the sovereignty of Rome, but they were independent of Rome in that The Decapolis included 10 cities. One of those cities was Damascus, Damascus of Syria. Most of the cities were on the east side of the Jordan River. And one of those cities was actually just south of the Sea of Galilee in Israel, on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. And it was uh, there at the the ancient city of Bashan. Now, we go there when we go to Israel. We see the ruins of that Roman city. It wasn't called Bat Shien. It was called a, by something else. But it's interesting because they have a theater there that seats, I believe, about 25,000 people. You see the streets and the marble 
columns, and it all came down in an earthquake. But that was one of the cities of the Decapolis. Now, Bet Shean is a tell there. And what a tell is, when you travel through Israel, uh, the ancient cities, you're talking about thousands of years of history, some of it 4,000 years. And, and as they, those villages would be destroyed or, or uh, overtaken, they would build on top of the ruins and then destroy it again and on top of the ruins and destroy it again and on top of the ruins. So as you travel through Israel, you see all these tells. Um, they're like um, a butte. And Bet Shean has a tell that's right there near that city that was of the Decapolis. And as you read about Bet Shean, it's interesting. You can climb up to the top of that tell and you can look and you can see to the west of you Mount Gilboa. You can see there in the valley in where the book of Judges tells us about Gideon and his 300 men that defeated the Midianites. You look to the east and there's the Jordan River and then on the uh, east side of the Jordan River where Ammon was and it's all very close and, and it's a, a good view where you can see a lot of the biblical sites that are there. But Bat Shean, you might recall that at the end of 1 Samuel, that it was Saul and his sons that were killed on Mount Gilboa by the Philistines, and they brought uh, the bodies of Saul and his sons, which included Jonathan, who was very close to David, as you know, and they pinned the bodies of Saul and his sons there on the wall of Bat Shean. So there was one of the cities of the Decapolis. Now, the Decapolis, they would mint their own coins. They had their own courts. They even had their own military and their own army. And in Mark's gospel telling us that he moved into the area of Decapolis, but also as he's bringing the healing to the people, uh, the people began to say amongst themselves that he has done all things well. And he does, doesn't he? Jesus does all things well. And I can look and I can see what he's doing in my life. And I can hear and I can see what he's doing in your life. And I can say he does things well. And as we come to him, when we've been healed spiritually, we've been forgiven, we're born again by the Spirit of God, we're made alive spiritually, that we know that now we can see. We can see the things of the Lord. We can see spiritually. Our eyes are opened up that we can hear of the things of the Lord and we can walk not in darkness, not in the world, but we walk in the light and we walk after him. And we discover that he does all things well and we know that the word of God declares to us that he promises to work all things out for good for those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. And you see, in this life, we go through the trials and we go through the difficulties and the challenges. But even in those bad, difficult times, he is working good in them. And the purpose is to draw you closer to him, to conform you into the image of Jesus Christ, for you to see his goodness and his faithfulness, to know that his promises are true for you. And that's what we're going to read as we continue here in this story of the feeding of the 4,000, verse 32. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they now have continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. So the miracle of Jesus, the one he's about ready to perform, is the feeding, as I said, of the 4,000. It's very similar to what we saw in the previous chapter, and that is the feeding of the 5,000. Now, there are a few of the higher critics. There are some who come along and say, well, that the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 that we're about ready to read about in the following verses, that they are really two different versions of the same miracle. But the Gospels, particularly Matthew and Mark, are very, very careful to point out that these are two different miracle meals that Jesus provided for the multitudes. And we will read next time in the, in the next chapter, chapter 16, that Jesus himself will point out that these are two different miracles that, that he's going to uh, perform here, different than the feeding of the 5,000. And as we look at the two miracles, there's similarities, but there's also some differences. For example, in the feeding of the 5,000, we know that it took place right there by the Sea of Galilee in that area called Bethsaida. 
Here, Jesus is in the area of the Decapolis, as I said, just north of the Sea of Galilee, on the east side of the Jordan River in the Decapolis. And we also know that there's some other notable differences that will be pointed out as we continue to read here. So to say that these are two versions of the same miracle is really ignoring what the Gospels truly declare. It is dismissing what Jesus declares. And listen, I just want to stop at this point in our study and to remind you that we do live in a day and age where it's not just the higher critics that may cast doubt on the Word of God and the miracles that are done in the Scriptures, but there's people all around us, aren't there? There may be some in your family or co-workers or others that say, the Bible isn't true, the miracles really didn't happen, uh, that's just an allegory. That was just a spiritual you know, story so we can learn something. And we can hear those things more and more in the day in which we're living in. And listen, many of those things that people try to cast out, whether they're higher critic and, critic and claim to be a scholar, or whether there's somebody that's linked to you in your life, that they say that isn't true or that miracle didn't happen. It's interesting that Jesus would put his stamp of approval on these two miracle meals, that they were different miracles. Also, in other places of the scripture that people say that didn't really happen. For example, Jonah. There are those who say Jonah wasn't swallowed by a big fish. That's just a story told to us to encourage us, to help us. Well, Jesus said it happened because what we're going to see in the next chapter, that when he comes back into the Galilee region, they're the religious leaders. They're waiting for Jesus, uh, and they're trying to, to accuse him. So they said, show us a sign. And Jesus said, no sign is going to be given to this generation except for the sign of Jonah. And just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a large fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You want to sign this generation? The sign's going to be my resurrection. And it's a sign not just for this generation, but every generation. There are those who come along and say, Adam and Eve, the, the story of, they're recorded in Genesis in the early chapters. Matter of fact, there are a few denominations and, and even circles of Christians that believe that the first 11 chapters of Genesis really aren't true. They're just recorded for us, kind of give us a, a story in how the world began. But actually, there was other civilizations. There was no worldwide flood, things like that. And so they dismiss it. But we are going to read that in Matthew chapter 19, they're going to come, the religious leaders, and ask Jesus about marriage and, and divorce. And Jesus will respond by saying, have you not read that in the beginning he made them male and female? He believed in Adam and Eve. And a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He goes back and quotes from Genesis chapter 2. We know that Jesus has said that the coming of the Son of Man is going to be what? Like the days of Noah. He puts his stamp of approval on those things. Uh, I was just hearing about uh, some who were doubting about Daniel. Daniel, who wrote the book of Daniel in the 6th century B.C., that it couldn't have been Daniel because the prophecies are so exact and so detailed. And it was another Daniel that wrote it later. Well, Jesus, we will read in the Olivet Discourse that he will say, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel the prophet, and, and he puts his stamp of approval of Daniel being a prophet that wrote the book of Daniel. So we need to remember what Paul would write to Timothy, that all scripture is inspired by God. God breathed, put to the page, and it is profitable. That means from Genesis 1, not Genesis 12, but Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation 22, 21. So here we know that they are two different miracle meals that Jesus performed. And he is here with the multitude. One of the differences that we just read is that this multitude is with Jesus for three days. In the feeding of the 5,000, they were with him for how long? For one day. And they would bring all those who were sick, lay them at Jesus' feet, as we just read, and Jesus having compassion on them, this theme of compassion that we have seen throughout Matthew's gospel as Jesus ministered to the people. Now, the religious leaders, they didn't minister to the people. They had contempt towards the people. 
And we know that it was the religious leaders that not only are they going to increase their opposition and, uh, against Jesus, but anyone who follows after Jesus. And I think about how different Jesus was. He was sensitive to the needs of the people. And Jesus says, I don't want to send them away, having not eat, knowing that they will not have the physical strength to get back to their homes, to the cities of the area, that they'll faint on the way. They've been with me for three days. And as we gather in this place, the Lord does desire for us to be filled, to be strengthened as we are fed by him. The Bible says that you and I are to be strong in the Lord. And the way that we can be strong in the Lord is being in a place as you are this morning, being fed the word of God as it feeds us and it strengthens us. And we know that Jesus would say in the Sermon on the Mount that blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For what? For you will be filled. And as we are filled and as we are growing in the word of God and being strengthened in the word of God, you're not going to faint as easily on your journey in life. And as we remember in the feeding of the 5,000, that when this need came up, remember that Jesus said to the disciples, uh, as they were concerned, they said, hey, we're concerned for the people. You need to send them away. And Jesus said, you feed them. And as you are being fed by the Lord and by his word, you have something to give to others. And I just want to reiterate that point. There's a lot of voices that are out there. There's a lot of information that's out there. There's a lot of philosophies that are being expressed today. But you are able to feed others the word as you are being fed. And as you get, are a voice of truth, it's going to be a blessing to them to strengthen them. So Jesus here, he wants to, to minister and feed the multitude. Verse 33, then his disciples said to him, where can we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few little fish. Now, isn't it interesting that it was a short time ago, I mean, we're only talking one chapter ago, that the disciples saw with their own eyes Jesus feeding a multitude of 5,000 with just a few loaves, five few muffins, and, and a couple little sardines. And as we read this, the feeding of the 5,000, we know that he would feed the multitude. That's just the men. That's not the women and the children. So the crowd was much bigger, could have been at least probably 10,000 or more. And the disciples, after everyone was full, that they picked up 12 baskets of fragments left over after all the people uh, were finished. So you would initially would tend to think that the disciples would have responded, knowing that Jesus, he wants to feed the multitude. Now there are those who say, well, maybe the, the disciples are thinking he's not actually going to feed them. Maybe he's hesitant in feeding them because he's in Gentile territory and he isn't going to minister to the Gentiles in that way. Well, we saw that last week that he ministered to that Canaanite woman, her needs, and showed compassion, commended her faith, worked in a very wonderful way. Sometimes they say, some say, well, maybe they thought that Jesus uh, would be concerned that they would want to crown him as king, and he doesn't want that to happen. But we know that Jesus said to them very specifically, I want to feed them. And they say, well, how's that going to happen? And Jesus, his response to his disciples, I think is worth taking note of, because he isn't harsh. He doesn't express disappointment with his disciples. But I do wonder if he was hoping that they would regard his past faithfulness as a promise to meet their present need. But these disciples, they're the slow to believe. They're still growing spiritually. And I know that I can be like that at times as well. Because in my own life, I have seen the Lord provide for me. I've seen his faithfulness. I've seen him even work miracles, that he's fed me and he's grown me. And then a need comes up and he meets that need. And I think, Lord, you're so good. Thank you, Lord. But then time passes. And once again, a need comes up or I feel like I'm out in the desert in a wilderness. And, and I think, Lord, 
I'm dry and I need to be fed. And Lord, how is this going to work in the circumstance that, that I'm in or the situation, the difficulty? How is it that you're going to provide? And I can have a tendency to forget his compassion and his goodness, his faithfulness, his promises to me. That I can lean back and see his past faithfulness and know that he desires to work again. And some of you, you may be feeling that way this morning. And I want you to know this. Just as he has worked in your life in the past, he desires to work in your life today and tomorrow and in the future. And it may not be in the exact same way or in the exact timing. In the feeding of the 5,000, they were with him for a day. In the feeding of the 4,000 here, they're with him for three days. But he does see you. He does know your need, and he cares for you. I love that little verse that Peter writes, that we can cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. And he will continue to show his compassion and his goodness and his faithfulness to you. And you will see it come to pass as he provides for you. So how did Jesus feed them? Well, much the same way in the feeding of the 5,000. Let's read in verse 35. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish, and he gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitude. So they all ate, and they were all filled, and they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Now those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children, so the number was much higher. And he sent away the multitude, got into the boat, and came to the region of Magdala, that's on the north uh, west side of the Sea of Galilee, not far from Capernaum. And we will see the religious leaders are waiting for Jesus. But once again, as he's in Decapolis, Jesus taking just a few loaves and a few fish, he blessed it and breaks it and then feeds the multitude to where they, they were all filled. Couldn't eat it anymore. And the disciples would pick up seven large baskets. Now, in the feeding of the 5,000, it's a different Greek word for basket. In the feeding of the 5,000, they were smaller baskets. And remember, they picked up 12 baskets full of leftovers. Here is a different Greek word. It means um, of a basket that's larger, like a hamper. Matter of fact, it's the same word that is used in the book of Acts when you recall that Paul was uh, lowered over the wall of Damascus as he would have to escape at night, and he was lowered in a basket, same word, in a hamper. So these are large baskets, the baskets that the Gentiles would use, and it makes sense. He's in Gentile territory. He's in the Decapolis. So once again, they gather more, much more, at the end of the meal than what was given to them at the beginning. Seven large baskets showing God's abundant provision. How are we going to feed all these people? Well, how many loaves do you have? Seven little loaves. Then give to me what you have, and I will bless it, and I will multiply it, and you will pick up seven large baskets. It's interesting that number seven keeps coming up because Paul in the New Testament, in the epistles that we have, wrote to what? Seven churches. In the book of Revelation, Jesus writes to seven churches in chapters two and three. So that number is interesting. He, he writes to them uh, those letters. And, but here, going back to our study, that we want to reiterate, as we talked about in the feeding of the 5,000 in the previous chapter, that we give the Lord what we have. And you may be thinking it's not very much. But in his hands, we will bless it and he will multiply it. You see, I think everyone that's come through the services this morning, we want to see God working, don't we? We want to see God working in our lives. We want increase. I'm not just talking about the, the physical, the material. But I want my devotion to grow, Lord. To increase my understanding of you, concerning you, Lord. I want my love for you to grow and my love for others as well. I want increase in the fruit that is produced in my life. I want increase in my service to you, Lord. And, and Lord... Bring that to me. But here's the thing that we need to remember. To have the Lord work that way in your life, you must give him your life. And I think you might be thinking, I know that. 
If you want increase in your life, that is spiritual increase, and just knowing him and loving him, and fruit being produced, and him using you and experiencing that abundant life, you must give him your life. And the reason I mention that is because perhaps you talk to sometimes people, and I do once in a while, and they become a Christian, and, and they're saved, they're forgiven, but it's kind of like I do the Jesus thing on Sunday. I come to church, that's when we come, and, and pretty much the rest of the week is mine. When it comes to my job, when it comes to my careers, when it comes to the kids and their activities, when it comes to my hobbies, when it comes to my finances, that's mine, Lord. The Jesus thing I'll do on Sunday. And, and I know that we don't desire to do that, but that's what can happen. Or we talk to people that that's the way they see Christianity. Listen, always remember this. When we come to Jesus, he isn't added to your life. He is your life. He's your life in every area of your life, every day of your life. And we can bring the bread and he will multiply it. We fill the jars with water, but he's the one that turns it to wine. And if we desire increase in our life, then we have to give him our life and give him our heart in every day. It's like the, the burnt offering of Leviticus chapter 1. They would bring the animal and it was a free will offering. It was an offering of worship. And they would take the animal and put it on the altar. And the whole animal was consumed. And it was a picture of that worshiper giving all to the Lord. And as Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, you know the verse, that because of the mercies of God, that you and I are to be what? A living sacrifice unto the Lord. He has been so merciful to us. And so being a Christian means he is our life. In every day of our life, in every area of our life, he is Lord over that. And we are to give him the first fruits of our life, not the leftovers. Give him the first fruits of your time, your energy, your talents, your gifts. And you may say it isn't much, but in his hands, watch him multiply what you have given to him to bring glory and honor to him. But something else that I'd like to pass along as we begin to close here, that as we understand that Jesus is going to feed them. And I have that underlined here in the story that he didn't want them to go away lest they faint on the way. He wanted to feed them with food so they would, they would be strong. They're fed bread. And as we look at this miracle that the Lord did, the miracle was done on the physical level. But the Lord wanted to do more. There's a higher priority with the Lord than just the physical, but it's the spiritual, the eternal. He doesn't want us just to focus or prioritize on the physical. He wants these disciples and us disciples here today to know that he doesn't just provide bread for our bodies, but more importantly, he provides this for the spiritual hunger as well. Jesus would say that I am the bread sent down from heaven, that I am the bread of life. And we've talked about how he said that in John chapter 6, right after the feeding of the 5,000. And you might recall in Matthew chapter 4 that Satan's temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, that Satan said to Jesus, hey, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered him by saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And what Jesus is saying is, it's not enough for you if all you're interested in and all you live for is for the physical, the material. You see, that's a very popular message in the church in so many ways. And so many people get caught up in, in the prosperity gospel. You know, that if you just plant your seed faith and give your money to me, then you're going to get a hundredfold. And that is the central message of many ministries that are across America. And they say that if you, you send it to me, then God's going to bless you and you're going to be wealthy. And you need to just have enough faith and you need to claim it. You need to name it. And you need to put that picture of that house, that boat, that new car on your refrigerator. And that's the focus. And it's so sad. It's so deceptive. God always wants you to be healthy. You just got to have enough faith. Or there is in the, the, the circles of Christianity today, it's very popular, to, to get in a motivational speaker. 
We want to motivate you and, and, and this and how to be successful in life. And listen, there may be some practical things to that, but the Lord desires for you and for me to focus on the eternal, on the spiritual. And listen, understand that if any of us, our priority in life is that we pursue just the material life today, looking at the temporal, and, you know, wanting possessions, you know, the prosperity gospel, whatever it might be, know that you are, are going to begin to be weak spiritually. And you're going to faint in due time. And if any of us want to be strong in the best sense of the word, be strong in the inner man and inner woman. As you feed upon the Lord, as you feed upon the word of God, it will keep you in the difficult circumstances and times that we are in. We need to be feeding on the spiritual bread that comes by believing in him, learning of him, worshiping him. And if that is your priority, then you're going to be strong in the Lord. And if he blesses you with earthly possessions and materials, praise God, because every good gift comes from above. Be thankful for it. Be a good steward of what he has given to you. But remember, it's all going to go away. It's all going to burn up someday. So don't get too attached to it. And we should have the mindset as Christians that everything that we have belongs to him. And Lord, I wanted to invest it for the kingdom. I want to prioritize the kingdom. I want to be a good steward of what you've given to me. There's all kinds of lessons throughout the New Testament concerning that. And to know that Jesus said, store up your treasure in heaven. Don't store up your treasures here on earth where rust can come and destroy, where moths eat, where thieves come in and break in. But we need to be taken in the spiritual food that comes from the word of God to allow him to strengthen us, to speak to us. That is our priority. Food that endures to everlasting life. We do need the physical food, don't we? And if we don't have the physical food in our bodies daily, we become physically weak and we will faint. Elijah, arise and eat. For the journey is long. Remember that story in 1 Kings? Elijah is running for his life. Jezebel says, I'm going to lop your head off. He runs to the mountain of God, and he's there in the desert, and, and he's asleep. And the angel wakes him up and says, Elijah, eat, for the journey is long. The journey is long, folks. And we need to learn to be taken in and eating of the word of God. And if we aren't, we're going to end up fainting. And I am seeing more and more Christians, I'm just going to be honest, I don't say this condemningly, I don't say this judgmentally, I say this just honestly. And it can happen to any of us. That there are many Christians today that are fainting because they have not prioritized taking in the things of the Lord and the Word of God in their lives. You know, it's interesting, I was looking at this this morning, but the author of Hebrews, I was reminded of this uh, what he wrote, if it was Paul or whoever, we know the Holy Spirit wrote the book of Hebrews. But he writes this, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. He's saying, listen, at a time you guys ought to be teachers, you're dribbling milk. You're babies. Now, none of us like to be called babies, do we? But he's saying that you are continue to take in the milk of the word, and you're not taking the solid food of the word of God. I think that you're here because you want to be fed. You desire to know God's word. And as pastor of this church, one of the things that I'm committed to is feeding you the word of God, the meat of the word. I'm not interested in being a motivational speaker. I'm not interested in giving you junk food. Because it may sound good, but it's not going to make you healthy. I desire for you to grow in the word of God and to take in the meat of the word and as you grow, I know that it's going to strengthen you and it's going to nourish you 
and you're going to end up being strong in the Lord, and you're going to be able to give to others. And we live in a day and age where we need that more than ever. We can get distracted by so many things, folks, can't we? There's, as I said, you know, endless news, social media, all these things. And listen, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be informed. We all want to be informed. But if that's all you're taking in all the time, all day long, then you're going to find yourself, you're going to be weakened and fainting. And that's why we have to be discerning of the days in which we are in. Jesus, if we're going to see next week, you don't want to miss it. He's going to say, listen, you guys can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times of the coming of the Son of Man. The things that we are seeing around us, they bother me like they bother you. They concern me. But I also know that the Bible speaks of these things, and we're going to talk more about it next time. I was thinking this week, because I had a conversation with somebody, I was thinking about it, it was 20 years ago, that I was standing down at Ground Zero after the Twin Towers fell, just ministering to New York City police officers. When the rubble, it was still burning. We would end the day with ash all over us as we were recovering body parts. It was a very dark and difficult time. And I think, Lord, where are we headed? I remember standing there with some pastors and standing there with Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, and he was there just shaking his head, saying, I can't believe this happened. And I thought, how worse can it get? And over 20 years now that I've seen that the days are more difficult than ever before. And if we are going to be strong in the Lord, we better be grounded in the word and discerning of the times in which we are in. And I think you guys know this. I'm not interested in playing church. I'm not interested in, in trying to do whatever that is so popular today that you draw in the crowds. I'm going to feed you the word of God. And I'm going to be committed to that because I know that that's what's going to strengthen you and help you. And as we travel together and being strengthened in the word of God, that the Lord desires to use us. You know, I think of Daniel. Remember Daniel ch chapter 5 and Belshazzar has that party. And Daniel, he was sidelined for about 20 years when he was serving Nebuchadnezzar to the end of the kingdom of Babylon, Belshazzar. And we know that the handwriting came. Remember, they were having a big party, and the handwriting came, a hand. It was the hand of God. And they said, how's, you know, what is this? And they called for all the, the magicians. They called for the, the soothsayers. They called for the wise men of Babylon. They couldn't interpret it. And they were told, the king was told, Belshazzar, there's one who has an excellent spirit of God, and he will interpret it. And here comes Daniel at the end of his life. And he comes out and said, I'll interpret the handwriting on the wall. The wisdom of God. Listen, we're able to give the interpretation of what's going on in a lot of ways. The handwriting's on the wall. To be strong in the Lord. And there are those in our lives, even as Joshua was told in Joshua chapter 1, be strong and courageous, Joshua. Three times the Lord told him in Joshua chapter 1. And then at the end, the people come and say, we ask that you be strong and courageous, Joshua. And there are people around us that they need us to be strong in the Lord. It doesn't mean that we don't have difficult days or we go through hard seasons. But the journey is long. And the Lord desires to use you. And the way for you to be used is to be feeding on the word of God. And then you're able to feed others as well. So we'll pick it up with this kind of this theme next time. But Father, we thank you. We thank you for this very important message given to us. Lord, we can look at this miracle. And we're so familiar with it. But we want to be reminded that you desire to feed us every time that we gather spiritual food, to be strengthened in the inner man or inner woman. And Lord, I pray that we would have a hunger for your word, not just to dribble in milk, 
or take in junk food spiritually, but to take in the meat of the word, knowing that that's how we can stand fast. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us in the days in which we are living in. I thank you for this morning. As we now come to the communion table, as we hold the elements in our hands and partake of them together, Lord, we thank you for the ultimate provision that you've given to us, your son, who allowed his body to be broken and his blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. And Father, I pray that this would be a time of worship and just seeking you and being thankful to you. We thank you for this time. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The communion elements are going to be handed out. You are welcome as believers. You don't have to join the church. You can't join the church anyway. So, um, but as a believer, the take of communion, there is, um, it's all in one thing as you take. There is the clear uh, wrapping here. Pull that off for the bread and then the second one for the cup. So the communion elements are going to be handed out. Take it and prepare yourself. Continue to just be in a place of just thanking the Lord and worshiping. And then we're going to partake of it together. Thank mm-hmm. you.